Well, thank you for worshiping with us. Let's jump into today's sermon. Uh, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 1. And um, the the setting of Ruth is the town of Bethlehem. A lot of people don't realize that Ruth took place in Bethlehem. And um, that's the, the title of our sermon series for this month is Under Bethlehem Stars. And so we're going to be looking at these happenings um, that happened a thousand years before Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, um, but how God was at work in and among his people um, in the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem a thousand years earlier. Now, Bethlehem was a small town. Um, it was about six miles south of Jerusalem. And, and so you have a, a small town setting here, and um, it's the setting for the book of Ruth. Now, Ruth, what we're going to be looking at in Ruth 1, um, a lot of the conversation is taking place in, in a, uh, an area called Moab, a nation called Moab. Um, and so we're going to jump in in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. I want to begin by reading the first 13 verses to just set up the setting of the book for you. So the word of the Lord says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left with her two, without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return to, from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I say I should have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, uh, this is an interesting setting for this story. Uh, the historical context of this, it's happen happening in the time of the judges. And so if you know anything about biblical history, um, God's people were enslaved in Egypt. Uh, the book of Exodus is about their escape from Egypt. Moses leads them out of there through the wilderness. And then ultimately Joshua leads the people of God into the promised land. After Joshua leads them into the promised land, they enter into what's known as the, the time period of the judges, where they're ruled not by kings, but they're ruled by judges. Now, this is the time period that this story that we're looking at, the story of Ruth, takes place. Uh, that that time period is about 1400 to 1000 BC. Around 1000 BC is when Israel got their first king, King Saul. Now, uh, famines were common in that time. Disasters uh, came upon people. Uh, they were seen as a divine judgments, and a famine had come upon the land of Israel. And in the Old Testament, a lot of times famines and things like that set the stage for God to orchestrate what he wills for his own glory and to display his sovereignty. And so in this famine that happens, um, this man Elimelech, uh, by the way, nobody names their sons Elimelech anymore. So if you're um, getting ready to have a son or if you plan on having a son one day, I would urge you to consider Elimelech. It, it just rolls off the tongue very nicely. Just kind of say that out loud and you know think about how an amazing name that is. But Elimelech takes his wife Naomi and they sojourn in, in a country called Moab, uh, which is east of the Dead Sea. So they go um, out of Israel, they cross the Dead Sea, and, and the, the nation on the other side of the Dead Sea was known as Moab. Um, this is modern day Jordan. And so they go into Moab and they settle there, not with the intention of staying forever, uh, but they sojourn there to remain so that they can have food and provision for their family. And so Limelech and 
and their sons Malon and Kilion, um, they all end up pass away, passing away. Uh, we don't know the circumstances of their death, but Elimelech dies, and then af- seemingly after Elimelech dies, Malon and Kilion take Moabite wives, uh, women from uh, from the nation of Moab. And they marry them, and then both of those sons die as well. And so what you have is Naomi, who's an older lady at the time we pick up the story, and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Now, they lived in a patriarchal society. And what I mean by that is that if you were widowed in a patriarchal society such as the ancient Near East, uh, you were without provision. Uh, Practically, you would have a hard time paying your bills and feeding yourself because you needed a man in that society to care for you. Now, we don't live in that society today. But I want you to understand the reason that Naomi says, are you going to wait for me to marry again and have sons that you can marry? The reason she brings up all that talk is because a husband was seen as necessary for provision. And if you were a woman and you didn't get married, you would either rely on your father or you would rely on your sons. Um, In this case, it seems like all three of these women have none of those men in their lives. And so they find themselves in kind of a desperate position. Just where my mind immediately went was the, the great classic film. Dumb and Dumber, uh, where where Lloyd Christmas just hits the end of his rope and he says, we got no money, we got no jobs, we got no food, our pets' heads are falling off, and he's freaking out because they, they just don't have anything and they don't know what they're going to do. And so what they decide in that great film is that they're going to go to a place of hope, a place called Aspen. And so they go on this long road trip to Aspen to find, uh, to find Mary Samsonite to, uh, to hopefully fall in love and, and then ride off into the sunset. Now, uh, they don't go to Aspen in the book of Ruth, but for them, their city of hope is a town called Bethlehem. And Naomi decides we will return to our homeland. She hears a rumor out in the fields of Moab that uh, that things are better in Bethlehem, that, that maybe the, the harvests are back, there's not the famine that there once was, and so she decides, we're going to go back home. And so verse 7 says, she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah, which is Israel. Now, in the absence of a husband, um, again, that responsibility of provision would have fallen on fathers or sons. And we know that Orpah and Ruth didn't have that because um, they actually, Naomi tells them to return not to their fathers or not to um, anyone else, but to return to their mothers. Um, verse 8 says, Naomi said to her daughters in law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as, as, he's, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you uh, that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now, Naomi never expects to see them again. And she blesses these two women and she encourages them to go back and leave her. Um, now, she prays that God would grant them rest. The Hebrew word is manuka. Um, it, it, was a, it was a little bit different than the term Sabbath or Shabbat, which was where we get um, the idea of the commandment of Sabbath rest. Um, this idea of rest, manuka, meant a comfortable relaxation, not necessarily worship. And so she's not inciting them that they would ultimately worship God and rest in his sovereignty, but she's rather saying, hey, I hope you have a really comfortable life. Um, there's there's really a lack of spirituality in what Naomi is um, blessing them with. She's wishing them a warm bed or a comfortable recliner. She's not wishing a house upon them. She's wishing a home upon them, but there's a lack of spiritual emphasis that we see from Naomi. And this is something that, um, you know, this comfort that she wishes upon them is something that she doesn't necessarily expect for herself. Uh, In verse 13, um, the second half of that verse, she says, No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, to me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And so leaving Israel um, could have been seen as contrary to God's will. When she left Israel with her husband Elimelech, um, that was something that would have been seen traditionally by her people as something that was against God's will. And so in Naomi's mind, she's wondering, is God mad at me? Am I being punished for sins that my family has committed? Furthermore, her sons married Moabite women, again, which is something that would have been contrary to God's will. Uh, They married women um, who were of foreign descent, and God's law in the Old Testament spoke very clearly against that. Deuteronomy chapter 7 tells us that. Um, It says, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. This is what Naomi thinks is happening to her. 
She thinks we've left Israel. Our sons have married foreign women and the Lord is angry with me. And so he is pouring out his wrath and vengeance on my family. Now, these laws about uh, marrying foreign women are a little bit strange to us, but I want to emphasize that these laws were not made on the basis of racial purity. They were not made on the basis of ethnic uh, purity. They were made on the basis of religious purity. God actually even gives the reason in Deuteronomy 7. He says, here's the reason I don't want you marrying foreign people. Um, he says, I don't want you doing that because they will lead you away from serving me and you will serve other gods. Um, and so there was actually um, an allocation allowed for God's people that if they um, would have foreigners come in and convert to Judaism, then they would be able to marry them. Moses, for example, uh, marries marries an African woman. Um, we have lots of that in the Bible um, that is seen as permissible in God's law. But in this case, it seems as if these Moabite women were not converts to uh, to Judaism. It means that these women seemingly were not worshipers of the one true God. And this is evidenced by when Naomi tells them to go back to their own gods. It seems that they had held on to the uh, false religion of the Moabites. And so Naomi thinks that this is the reason that she's being punished by God. And verse 15 says that Orpah actually turns back and Orpah returns to her gods. Uh, so Moabite religion was polytheistic. Um, I'm under the persuasion and, and conviction that it was probably also demonic. Um, and yet God is sovereignly drawing this Moabite woman, Ruth, to himself through the circumstances of an angry Jewish woman, um, drawing Ruth into his family, into his kingdom, a woman that will ultimately be in the lineage of our Savior, Jesus. God is sovereignly drawing Ruth into that family from a land of pagan worship. And Naomi here can do nothing but get mad. She describes herself as being bitter, and she perceives that God is bitter with her, so in turn she's bitter with God. And what I would encourage you with is you cannot allow uh, negative circumstances in your life to make you bitter and angry against God. Um, it's okay to experience those emotions, but I would encourage you to rest not in those emotions, but to rather rest in the gospel, the hope that you have. And so I have two cures, um, two applications for you today uh, that I want to briefly go over um, about bitterness and depression that's so prevalent and common, especially in 2020, right? Um, and what I want to encourage you to is, number one, unwavering loyalty to the Lord um, will cure any bitterness or depression. And secondly, sure and certain hope in the Lord. Um, resting your hope in the gospel uh, will help with that as well. And so let's look at those two applications. Number one, loyalty. We see loyalty in Moab. Uh, we're called to this unwavering loyalty to the Lord. Uh, Lord, when you see that in all caps in your Bibles, um, is Yahweh. Um, that's his name that he has proclaimed for himself. God has, gives his name as Yahweh, um, which means I am. Now, the Moabites, again, were polytheistic, but they had a favorite God, and his name was Kamash. Naomi um, is a pretty wretched character in this play because she's she's telling Ruth to, uh, to, to go back and telling Orpah to go back to serve Kamash rather than serve Yahweh. She blesses them with material things and says, I hope that you have a comfortable life. But she ultimately tells them to go back and worship um, a demonic false god. Verse 14 says, They lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. May we never be like Naomi, right? May we never be content to leave the lost in their lostness. May we always uh, be encouraging them to come along with us. May we meet them where they are and say, come with us and serve the one true God. Come with us and serve Jesus. Now, our loyalty to God means we invite others into this loyalty. If we're truly loyal to God, then we call others into that loyalty. Now, Ruth, the protagonist of this book, is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, Naomi, um, to be frank, is not all that appealing of a travel companion. Um, she's uh, her mother-in-law. And, and, you know, just ask yourself, would you really want to commit to a lifetime with your mother-in-law? Maybe if you're sitting with your spouse right now, maybe don't answer that out loud. But um, it's, it's not a hugely desirable situation and future that Ruth kind of sees herself in. Her choice is between the cranky mother-in-law, Naomi, who's angry, and an uncertain journey, by the way, to Bethlehem, which was no easy trip. 
Uh, the other option is to go back to Moab, the place where she's from, but where she has no father, where she has no husband, where she has no sons to provide for her, and she will be helpless and most likely homeless. Ruth makes the choice to remain loyal um, to Naomi. And in her loyalty to Naomi, she also becomes loyal to Yahweh. Let's look at that. This beautiful proclamation in Ruth 1, 16 through 18, um, kind of the, the climax of chapter 1, Ruth's declaration of loyalty. It says, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. You see, her proclamation of loyalty is beautiful, isn't it? It's even poetic in the Hebrew language. She makes this great speech that silences Naomi and stops Naomi from urging her to go back to Moab. But it's kind of a blind commitment, isn't it? She's blindly saying, hey, your God's going to be my God. And that's not really how we encourage people to make conversion professions of faith, that well, I'm going to convert to another religion just because of a person rather than God. Um, it's not the way that we would, you know, really want it, but um, but it is a conversion nonetheless. It is a profession of faith in Yahweh nonetheless. And what you see here is that she swears this oath by Yahweh, not by Kamash, the God that she would have been raised to worship, the, the God that her father and mother would have taught her to praise and adore and worship, this false demonic God of Kamash. She doesn't swear an oath by Kamash. Rather, she swears an oath by Yahweh. At the end of her speech, she says, May the Lord do to me, and even more so, if anything but death parts me from you. What that means is uh, it was a common way of saying, I am swearing a pledge of allegiance to you and to Yahweh, and if I break that, may Yahweh's wrath be poured out upon me. Now, Ruth is imperfect in her faith. Uh, she pledges allegiance to Yahweh, but not really in the right way. Uh, Ruth is imperfect because her loyalty is tied to God through Naomi. Um, but, but God's going to redeem that. And God's going to get glory from that. And we're going to see throughout these four chapters in the book of Ruth that Ruth actually becomes sanctified in that. And isn't that most of our stories, right? We come to Christ. We come to Christianity with imperfect uh, testimonies. We come not really understanding everything that we ought to be and who we ought to be. But yet God begins to clean us up and make us what he wants us to be. Now, Ruth comes with this hopeful mentality, but Naomi is still bitter. Notice that in verse 18, it says that Naomi said no more. It just reminds me of this awkward road trip. Like they, they begin to travel together. And if you've ever been on a road trip where there's, there's no music and there's no, there's no conversation happening, it's just a little bit awkward, right, to sit in a car with someone if there's none of that happening. And that's how I imagine the trip from Moab to Bethlehem with Naomi and Ruth. Uh, Naomi's mad. Ruth is like, you know, skipping along, hopeful for the future. And it's just awkward between them. But what they are hoping for is to find hope in Bethlehem. And so we talked about loyalty. Let's finish the sermon by talking about hope. Uh, hope primarily in Bethlehem. Now, their primary reason for moving back was to live, just to survive. That's why they're going back to Bethlehem, to eat. Now, what's fitting is the, the name Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. So they are going to the house of bread, which is a fitting place when you're worried about how you're going to feed yourself. What this shows us is that we can have hope in the most dire circumstances. Um, they, have, they have lost seemingly everything, and they're coming back to a place where they hope that they can be cared for. Verse 19, we pick up and see uh, the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity? upon me. Wow, what a buzzkill Naomi is, right? And you got to think Ruth is standing there like, the Lord's brought you back empty. Like, what about me? Like, I pledged my allegiance to you that I'm going to die where you die, and your people are going to be my people. And Ruth is seemingly ignored by the people in Bethlehem, and Naomi's griping about everything. And uh, by the way, Naomi's name means pleasant. 
And she's being anything but that in this narrative. Um, and when she gets back to town, it says that the whole town was stirred. People begin to gossip and talk about what's happened since Elimelech and Naomi left. And she comes home with a foreign daughter-in-law. And that would have been very noticeable in Bethlehem. And Naomi kind of claps back with this retort, still accusing God of dealing bitterly with her. Um, still angry with God. Um, the, the, the word Mara that she uses, she says, call me Mara is the Hebrew word that just means bitter. And what's interesting is the Hebrew word Mara is used in the same way that the English word bitter is used. Like we can use bitter in two different ways. We can describe food as tasting bitter. If it's repulsive and gross, we would say it's bitter. Uh, it's, it's lacking a sweetness. But bitter can also mean an emotion, right? An, an angry resentment. And in the Hebrew language, the, the word Mara was the same. It described food, and it also described um, an emotion. And so Mara, Naomi, is saying that she's both of those, that she is angry, and she's also leaving a bad taste in everyone's mouth. She's likely alluding back, as she says, call me Mara, to the time that her forefathers and their ancestors left the nation of Egypt and came into the wilderness. After they cross through the Red Sea and see God do this great miracle, he leads them to a place in the desert where they find water. They're extremely thirsty, but when they drink the water, it doesn't taste good. It's actually bitter. It's described as being bitter water. And they begin to cry out and complain to Moses. And they say, why'd you bring us out here? There's bitter water and we're not going to be able to survive. And God miraculously makes the water sweet. Um, to, to quench their thirst. And what God teaches them in that is that that bitterness was meant to, the, the, the bad taste of the water was meant to lead them into repentance so that they would trust the Lord more fully. And that's the, way, that's the case of all of our trials and circumstances. The book of James tells us to count it all joy when we enter into various trials and tribulations because those things work in us steadfastness and faithfulness. And here Naomi doesn't take her own advice. She says, the Lord's dealing bitterly with me. I'm now bitter toward him. And she even alludes back to the Old Testament story of Mara, but she fails to repent, which is the whole point of Mara, that the bitterness was meant to lead to repentance, and Naomi lacks that. And so she enters into Bethlehem bitter, hopeless, angry, uh, but Ruth, I believe, is filled with hope. And in verse 22, we just have this kind of hint of what's to come in the future. It says, So Naomi, Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem. Look at the time they come back to Bethlehem, at the beginning of barley harvest. They arrive right when they're harvesting grain. That They come for provision, and at the time that they arrive, it's time for everyone to bring in their harvest and they're in the house of bread Bethlehem they're going to be making lots of bread there's going to be food that is abundant and they're going to be provided and cared for now as a, as a point of application we know that all scripture points us to Jesus uh, every story in the Bible whispers Jesus's name and this takes me to a thousand years after Ruth walks into Bethlehem there's going to be another woman walk into Bethlehem uh, hope would come in Bethlehem, and a woman would make a hard journey to Bethlehem a thousand years later, and this woman, like Naomi, would find herself in a precarious position. She would find herself in a place where people are gossiping in town and talking about her. Uh, this woman is pregnant out of wedlock, but this woman, her name is Mary. Like Ruth, she would trust Yahweh more than she trusts her own plan, and Mary would sing a song similar to the, to the song that Ruth sang, a song of loyalty and commitment to Yahweh, that Mary would say, I am a handmaiden for the Lord. I am a servant of the Lord. And she would make oaths uh, professing her faith in Yahweh and trust in Yahweh. You see, Mary traveled the same roads into Bethlehem looking for hope in a tumultuous time in her life, not certain of her ability to carry out God's plan. But in the house of bread, Bethlehem, a thousand years after this story of Ruth, there are preparations being made for the bread of life to be delivered. That what we celebrate at Christmas is Jesus being born, that God becomes man, that, that Jesus, who has always existed, stepped off the throne and came to be born in Bethlehem in a manger in a lowly stable to become what he declares as an adult man to be the bread of life. That from this house of bread, we would receive his body and his blood in a sacrifice on the cross that we would eat Sunday after Sunday to remind ourselves that he is ultimately 
our provision. He is who cares for us. He is who we trust in. And when it feels like everything around us is falling apart, we repent and we lean on him and we trust in the bread of life. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for being that bread. Thank you for providing for us, for being the daily bread that we need. Um, Lord, thank you for taking care of us in your sovereignty. And so many times we're like Ruth and Naomi and Mary and Joseph, and we're in these positions in our lives where we don't see what you're doing and we have no clue if things are going to work out okay. But God, I pray that you would help us to see that everything is fine in Jesus. Everything is taken care of in you, our Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that we would trust you more, that we would lean on you, and that we would love you more every day. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.